Thanks for the introduction. I presume this is the concluding session on German leadership angst. Wrap up everything we have considered and perhaps we can draw some conclusions now. I want to go back for a moment. When the Federal Republic uh, of Germany was created in 1949, the ashes of World War II and of the Holocaust were, so to speak, still smoldering. The country was thoroughly destroyed, totally demoralized. The Cold War had reached its first peak of tension with the Berlin blockade and with the sealing of the border between East and West through the Iron Curtain. And the country, though endowed with a federal constitution, had no rights whatsoever, even on domestic issues. The allied powers were the rulers. If anybody had mentioned German leadership at that moment, it would have been considered as a most objectionable reminder of the country's nightmarish past or laughable. Now here we are 60 years later, the same country, now including the formerly communist Eastern half, living in a very different Europe, whole and free, is now asked by a chorus of politicians, governments, business persons to provide leadership with insistence, with impatience, but more important, the Berlin government is accused of shunning leadership. Angst of leadership is the term that we use here at this conference. And equally interesting, it faces at the same time, when trying to exercise leadership, a lot of resentment, often couched in most offensive terms, relating to the Nazi past. After 1949, the Federal Republic for decades remained a follower and a partner, and definitely not a leader in building up European institutions, in building, helping to build up uh, the Western Alliance. The country did not create a foreign policy, but a foreign policy created the country, the foreign policy of the West. How could it lead anywhere? Germany concentrated on overcoming its horrible past, rehabilitation, rebuilding the country. It became an enthusiastic partner in European integration, a proponent of pooling sovereignty based on the reconciliation with France. It was in the area of reconciliation with Israel where the Federal Republic developed a profile of its own, though not yet leadership, when it secretly supplied weapons to Israel. And when the secret came out, it faced an immensely hostile reaction by the Arab world, something the young republic was totally unused to. During the Ostpolitik under Chancellor Willy Brandt, the development of a new relationship both with East Germany and with the rest of Eastern Europe, the bloc under Soviet leadership, that became another area where the West German government developed a profile of its own, but it did not yet represent leadership. Though at that time, that policy enjoyed a lot of support, particularly in Europe. The first elements of leadership emerged under Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, that was in the 1970s. The Federal Republic, then already West German, Western Europe's most important economic power, the largest, the, the largest economy, joined forces with French President Giscard d'Estaing to create the EQ, the precursor of today's euro, and joined forces to launch the summit of the economic powers, the G8 of today. The leadership was exercised again under Chancellor Helmut Kohl when he played a decisive role in his partnership with President George Bush, Mikhail Gorbachev, President Mitterrand, in unifying Germany, 
in creating the arrangements that ended the Cold War and the arrangements that restructured Europe. And on European integration, Kohl followed the example of Helmut Schmidt to cooperate closely with his French counterpart in leading the process to create a new treaty on the European Union, the abolition of the Deutsche Mark, very important, and the creation of the common currency, the euro. From the beginning of German leadership, a German leadership role, there is a striking pattern which we can emerge, which we can observe until today. Even in rejecting Germany's usual posture of follower and partner of the United States, leadership is always sought and developed in close association with France. Chancellor Gerhard Schröder's and President Jacques Chirac's opposition to America's invasion of Iraq is an example as well as today's policy uh, and cooperation between Angela Merkel and President Sarkozy, often dubbed Merkozy. They work together, but there are deeper reasons for this cooperation. I think there are three interconnected, differing patterns of rejecting, structuring, and exercising leadership uh, by Germany which we can observe in the post-war period. First, in foreign policy in general, it must be remembered, and I said it, Germany's formal prerogatives were initially minimal, and even after the treaties of 1955, which regulated rearmament, Germany did uh, not have any rights. They did not even extend to, they did in particular not extend to the central issues of German foreign policy, notably unification. As I said, Germany concentrated on rehabilitation, following allies, and avoiding a strong profile or positions that could be controversial. It was dubbed Kultur der Zurückhaltung, the culture of restraint. A whole generation of German diplomats acted in this tradition. The ghosts of the past were always around and too often German acts were quickly denounced as here they go again or the Fourth Reich marching. British tabloids have profitably played on these issues for decades and still do today. This environment engendered a fear of being alone. In the German pasture, and it resulted not only in the characteristic low profile of German diplomacy, but its constant effort to seek allies with whom it could share interests and activities. France was the preferred partner in Europe, and of course the United States was the preferred partner in the West as a whole, particularly on security issues. To deviate from this pattern was not easy. And the best example of Germany's internal doubts about a greater role was provided by Germany's effort to seek a permanent seat in the Security Council of the United Nations. At a moment when Foreign Minister Klaus Kinkel and his diplomats uh, were energetically pursuing this goal, while Chancellor Kohl sent his special envoy to Washington to torpedo that very undertaking. And he was supported um, in that effort by a German public opinion which was divided, in which statesmen like Helmut Schmidt publicly ridiculed the goal of a permanent seat for Germany. Second, in the field of security, the weight of Germany's history is particularly heavy. Given the German responsibility for the horrors of World War II and the Holocaust, Anti-militarist and pacifist statements and uh, sentiments were always strong. German rearmament and membership in NATO came about against strong resistance and was helped in a way by Soviet behavior, by the Korean War, and of course by constant American support in this direction. Germany built up a very considerable military force, fully integrated in NATO, but the assumption always was 
that the purpose of the Bundeswehr was to deter a Soviet aggression and never to be obliged to fight. At the core of the widespread German reluctance to use military force and consequently to play a leadership role in this field in particular is the inability of post-war Germans to comprehend that military power force can also be seen positively as a means of liberation, of fighting suppression, or ending gross injustice as it is perceived in the collective memories of countries like the United States or France. The children or grandchildren of the very Germans who conquered and suppressed other countries could simply only see the negative side of military force and consequently did not develop the attitudes to their national military as they are perfectly customary in the United States, Britain, or France. This only changed in the 1990s with the Balkan Wars, when Germans, notably the, note, the younger generation, and I was right in the middle of this, um, watched with growing horror the reckless use of force by Serbia, the ethnic cleansing on their television screens, and as a result, the prevailing post-war paradigm came to be totally reversed. Notably, the German history of military force, rather than morally prohibiting military intervention, now morally demanded it. That was the crucial moment, the Kosovo intervention. Though the legitimacy, the legitimacy of Germany's armed forces, as well as their use in post-Cold War instances, such as the Balkans, Somalia, um, Afghanistan, UNIFIL, has considerably increased. Reservations due to the old attitudes still exist. They explain in part the caveats which the Bundestag imposed on the use of the German troops in Afghanistan and the general difficulty of parliamentarians to score points with their constituents by sending German troops abroad to protect the German homeland there in Asia. As a result, the parliamentarians prefer not to raise the issue at all with them. The regrettable decision of the German government to abstain in the UN Security Council on the Libya intervention was in all likelihood influenced by similar considerations, namely to please voters before a major state election. Third, in the field of economic and financial policy, Germany's history also left a mark on German leadership behavior, but this time, not as a constraining, but as a driving force. Two major inflations, with their enormously destructive consequences for the middle class, have left an indelible imprint on Germany's collective consciousness. The resulting willingness to avoid a repetition at all cost receives crucial, absolutely crucial reinforcement from the conviction that it was the 1920s inflation with its social consequences that paved the way for Germany's historical catastrophe of the Nazism. Whereas Germany's inf in in inflations create an avoidance impulse, the reverse is true for the post-World War II success of the economy, which resulted in an almost missionary drive to uphold and propagate its lessons. What could be wrong with a policy that catapulted the country from a devastated nation to the top economies of the world, to the first exporting country in the world just being deposed to number two by China? What could be wrong with it? The social market economy, a well-regulated management labor relationship, export orientation, fiscal responsibility, labor market reforms, and above all, hard work, are considered elements of a successful formula advanced with a conviction that outsiders often perceive as a hard-to-bear self-righteousness. The combination of the desire to avoid inflation in Europe and of the wish to advance its own economic model 
therefore constitute the powerful drivers of Germany's leadership role. No angst here. Not surprisingly, the negative reactions to German leadership do not arise in the areas of foreign or security policy where there is little leadership. But, of course, they arise in the realm of economic and financial policy, where Germany's posture, inspired by its own firm and strong convictions, clashes with the views and cultures of the countries supposed to follow the German lead, shared usually by other countries, notably France and Northern Europeans. And it is here that the German past comes back with a vengeance. As Il Giornale characterized the German Euro position after referring to Auschwitz, quote, these Germans are still arrogant and dangerous today. The cannons no longer thunder, but the weapon of the currency is no less dangerous, end of quote. By the way, the paper is owned by Mr. Berlusconi. Uh, <laughs> even worse are the reactions in Greece where reminders of the German occupation during the war, and it was a terrible occupation, are part now of the public discourse and burnings of the German flag, as well as swastika decorated images of the German chancellor can be found. And the Greek president only three days ago again made a reference talking, to, talking about finance minister Schäuble, saying that the Greeks know how to defend their freedom. Germany's posture is either criticized as too dominant and nationalistic or as inadequate and too passive. Among the first group of critics are those who notably argue, as Ulrike Gero and Mark Leonard of the, Council on European, the European Council on Foreign Relations do, that Germany uses the, quote, unilateral moment, unquote, to establish itself as economic hegemon and to undo the transatlantic post-war order and the integrationist structure of Europe. There's no doubt that Germany today occupies a decisive and very strong position in Europe. Did not a smirk by Merkel and Sarkozy in the press conference, at last, lead to Silvio Berlusconi's downfall? Together they could summon Papa Andreo and make him change his publicly announced policy as they did in the G20 summit in Cannes. As the strongest economic power with the largest resources, Germany shapes the debate and nothing can be done without it. Indeed, Sarkozy, in addressing the French public, depicted Germany's reforms taken by the Social Democratic Chancellor Gerhard Schröder as the model for France to follow. But the allegation of a German anti-European revisionism has no basis in reality. These critics overlook that for years, German leaders, including Finance Minister Schäuble and Chancellor Merkel, have argued that the logical way out of the sovereign debt and euro crisis is a deepening of integration, indeed more federalism. The fiscal compact decided by the European Union last December, though not fiscal federalism, clearly represents a step toward more coordination of and discipline in fiscal policy. It represents such a deepening of integration that Britain felt obliged to veto a treaty change so that the fiscal compact had to be concluded as a separate treaty and not as a revision of the EU treaty, with lots of consequences. No doubt the present German government wants more movement in the direction of federalist solution and is supported in that opinion by the social democratic opposition as we have heard from uh, Mr. Steinberg. And it is also constrained by the Constitutional Court, which that's a factor which is often overlooked by the outside critics. And it is constrained by the probable reluctance of its European partners to really accept a genuine pooling of sovereignty in a federal approach. What then of Thomas Mann's famous wish for a European Germany and not a German Europe? Well, in one sense, Thomas Mann's wish has come true. The reunited and again economically, not militarily, powerful Germany 
is thoroughly European in its outlook, beliefs and goals. But in one sense, European Union Europe has adopted a German veneer. In its attempt to reverse the post-war trend of ever-growing debt, to engage in fiscal responsibility, and to engender structural reform. But it is not a diktat by a hegemon, but an approach free and responsible governments have come to accept as a rational and imperative solution to preserve competitive and functioning European societies. A second critique of the German posture argues that Germany is not doing enough. As Polish Foreign Minister Radoslaw Sikorski succinctly put it in a speech in Berlin in November last year, I quote, I fear Germany's power less than its inactivity, end of quote. Coming from a country that has suffered more than any other country from the excesses of German power, this statement was not only sensational, moving to old hands in this field like me, but it pointed to a real problem. German policy on Europe has indeed often been reluctant, too late, and too modest in its proposals. Mr. Steinbrück made the same point. But leadership is a learning process. And the new Germany still has to learn how to exercise it. Moreover, several factors constrain the German government's ability to act fast and comprehensively. The German political class and public clearly lag behind the government and must be persuaded, which requires efforts and time. Many appeals have to be made and were made to convince the public that the euro was and remains a great advantage for Germany, therefore requiring a special German effort to help the European countries in need. Finally, all policies have to take into account the somewhat Euro-skeptic rulings of the German Constitutional Court, thus restricting enormously the margin of maneuver of the German government. In conclusion, it can be said that if there is angst of leadership, it exists in the realm of security and a little less in foreign policy, but even there, it's still there. But in the area of fiscal and economic policy, there is no angst of German leadership. What exists is perhaps the inaptitude of leadership typical for an adolescent leader. Thank you very much.